Hello and welcome. My name is Trish Lynch from IOHR here in London. Thank you for being with us for another episode of our Human Rights TV. The recruitment and use of children during conflict is one of the six grave violations identified and condemned by the UN Security Council. In 2017, there were at least 18 armed conflicts in which children participated, and close to 46 states are still recruiting children under the age of 18 into their armed forces. With us today is Sandra Olsen, Programme Manager at Child Soldiers International, a UK-based NGO that focuses on the prevention of child recruitment and the use of exploitation of children in the armed forces and in groups. Sandra, thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you with us. Now, can you tell me why would anybody want to recruit child soldiers? Why are children being used in conflict? Well, there are many reasons for that. Um, once, oh, the first thing I'd like to say is that there is not particular reasons, or they're not, there's not particular regions or people or or cultures that are that are prone, more prone to use children in armed conflict, but rather it's just that wherever we have conflict today, we see conflict in an increased er um, number of areas, and whatever you have, whenever you have conflict, children will be recruited, recruited and used. And um, for many of these children, because many children today join on their own accord, so to speak, some are um, abducted and forced to join, but many of them join because it's considered to be the lesser evil or even the only option that they might have. If you don't have education, you don't have access to employment or even food for the day, um, if you want to secure some type of security for your family, then this might be considered the only or the best option, unfortunately. It's quite tragic, isn't it, that, that an estimated 30% of child soldiers voluntarily sign up because they feel there's no other option? Uh, yeah, I don't know the 30%, but yeah, there is an increased uh, number of children who, who join because they see this as the, as the only solution. Why would it be the only solution? I suppose if they're living in a conflict zone, it could be for protection. Mm -hmm. Poverty, lack of education are also mm -hmm. big problems, aren't they? Absolutely. Education is a huge thing. Um, amongst Another thing to add is some, some children will um, join an armed group to seek revenge if there's been attacks from other armed groups in the area and someone, someone in their family has been attacked, sexually abused, somebody has stolen something from them, uh, children might join to, to seek revenge. But um, we work in, uh, in several countries and some recent research that we did in DRC, we found that the majority of the girls who joined voluntarily had done so because they could no longer pay for their school fees. Education is a big thing, isn't it? Because without education, your marriage potential is almost zero and then you have no way of looking after yourself by getting a job. So education really is a key thing, isn't it? Absolutely. And with literacy and numeracy comes also sort of better uh, capability of handling yourself. You're not so easily fooled or tricked into doing things. So yes, absolutely. Education is, is key. According to UN estimates, since the adoption of the Child Protection Law in 2009, it's estimated that between 2009 and 2015 that over 8,500 children have been recruited as child soldiers. 600 of these are thought to be girls, and of that total, of that 8,500, 50% are under the age of 15. Now, they were the figures from 2009 to 2015. Mm -hmm. Has anything changed since then? Is there any light on the horizon? Well, uh, first thing to, to remember is that those cases are so-called verified cases, which means that the UN have been able to verify them. What we know is that that number is always going to be a lot smaller than, than the reality. And you mentioned girls, which I'm very glad that you did, because in DRC, as is elsewhere, there's been a huge problem in, in reaching the girls. Um, so UN report from, from two years ago, from 2015, actually looked at all children who had been demobilised, which means released from, from armed groups and armed forces. Of all those children, only 7% were girls that came out. However, by interviewing all of the boys that they managed to release, they were um, able to estimate that uh, girls actually make up to 30 to 40% okay. of all children in all groups. That means that we have a huge number of girls that hasn't been helped to um, leave the group, who may still be, uh, be with the armed groups, um, or who've, who've uh, managed to escape on their own accord and sort of uh, went back home but without any support, without getting any real help. 
When you say those that have been released, why do they take them, abduct them, have them as child soldiers and then release them? Is it because they're no use to them anymore because they're too old to be impressionable? Is that why? Um, I wouldn't say so, no. Uh, when I say released or demobilised, that is a sort of joint collaboration between the UN, the peacekeeping mission in, um, uh, in DRC, UNICEF, and their local partners. So what they normally do is they sort of reach out to armed groups whenever there's a possibility. They um, inform them that what they're doing to keep children under 15 and even under 18 in DRC is illegal and that they risk retributions if they, if they keep their children and they need to hand them over to to child protection actors. So it is uh, more of a sort of work of sensitizing the armed group leaders that it's illegal and you can't have children within your ranks. And you just said that 7% of those returning are girls. Why is the number so low? Um, there's a number of reasons why it's more difficult for girls to, to leave armed groups and for the UN and for the organizations working on this to reach the girls. So one thing is that girls are often not considered as combatants, as, as soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, and that problematic or that difficulty actually lies in the wor wor word as well. We say child soldier. Um, but there are many different generally jobs, Generally speaking, there? yes, exactly, exactly. But when you say child soldier, you sort of tend to quickly think about a boy with a, with a big gun. Um, but children are used for many things and um, for people who work in the field, you normally talk about children associated with armed groups because mm -hmm. you can be a porter, you can be a spy, you can be a wife, which is um, the issue for, for many girls. They are not considered as soldiers by the armed groups, but as wives, which means that they would be kept behind whenever the armed group would speak with the UN or with the organisations trying to ne negotiate children's release. Um, so they'd be hidden away? They'd be hidden away, yeah. yes. Um, and they wouldn't be um, as easily convinced to release the girls as they would uh, to release the boys because they are mothers of their children and they take care of the cooking and the sort of survival of the armed group. And I'm assuming that there's a lot of sexual exploitation with the boys but predominantly with the young girls I imagine. Yeah, I mean as you say it happens for, for both young boys and young girls but um, of all the girls that I've met almost everyone um, speaks about a numerous sexual abuses that they've lived through. Now that's seven percent that do return. You would imagine they would return to a warm welcome from their families and their communities but in fact it's the exact opposite. They're considered damaged goods. It's assumed they've been sexually exploited and they're shunned by their families and their communities. What happens to these girls? Well, so um, Child Soldiers International is mainly a research and advocacy organisation. So we normally tend to do research and then we try to, based on the research, develop tools or sort of um, guidance to, to people who work in the field to sort of facilitate their work. Mm -hmm. And what we did in DRC was that we spoke to over 150 girls who used to be with armed groups and we asked them, sure, of course, how the time uh, with the armed group was, how they ended up there, but we mainly focused on um, how how what happened when they came back home and as you say it's unfortunately very frequent for girls in eastern DRC as elsewhere to be considered as if they've lost all social value mm -hmm. when they've been with the armed groups um, and in sort of extension because they've known men outside of marriage uh, so as you say many of the girls came back home most of them had managed to escape on their own accord so really um, you know, not listening to any reason that they had because everyone was really scared. People who tried to escape were killed before their eyes. But you know, in the in the midst of a combat or or a fight, they tried to go home, and they've been dreaming about this moment for months and months. And all they could think about was you know how to see their family again and how they wanted to be back home. Unfortunately, when a lot of them came back home, the families found it really difficult uh, to accept them back home. Mm. Um, and we're not talking about, uh, you know, uh, mean individuals or difficult fathers. We're talking about a whole community where the neighbours are really suspicious of these girls. So it's really difficult for the families as well. Um, but yeah, most of these girls were shunned, um, even if they were, um, some were even sort of had the door slammed in their face from their uh, own families. Even if they were welcomed back home, they were or they are considered second class citizens. 
Um, many of them were not allowed to, um, to um, sort of play or be with their old friends. Uh, people pointed at them. People so what happens to them? Nobody wants them. <coughs> they have no education. Many of them, I know, actually go back, don't they? Yeah, they do, unfortunately, because they see it as the... As the only way. Yeah. Rather, a lot of the girls told us that I would rather stay here and die here than come home and be, uh, and be stigmatised, be completely sort of discriminated by my family and the, the ones that I love. Um, but what we did after we spoke to these girls, we asked them, so what can, what can be done differently? Mm -hmm. What could help? Uh, what could give you your value back? What could make your community accept you again? And one of the things that came out the strongest was education. Education was the most efficient way for a girl, even if she was considered to have lost value, even if um, everyone said, nobody will ever marry you, you're useless, we, we don't want you here. So the education so, changed all of that? Yeah. Changed their future, basically? Yeah, education is one of the uh, biggest things. Um, second thing is um, you have to involve the respected community leaders in the community. Um, if you get the people who other people listen to on your side mm -hmm. or on the girl side, the priest, very much religious leaders, but also teachers, uh, local leaders, sort of important business um, entrepreneurs, if you have them on your side and if they take some of their time to, you know, something as little as speaking to one of these girls or the priest asking uh, her help to collect the Bibles after church on Sunday, something as small like that will change the mindset of the other people in mm -hmm. the community. They respect the priest and by seeing that the priest gives some of his time, think that, it's, that this girl is worthy of some of this time. Um, that will also change how they perceive the girls. Um, so what we did to sort of test out the, the research findings or to test out what the girls said and also to give something back to the girls who actually helped us with our research and share their stories, we started up these small um, sort of mini education project with our partners in, in three different regions in DRC. And uh, we started literacy and numeracy classes because unfortunately a lot of these girls have never been in school before. Um, some girls were able to go back straight to school uh, and some go through sort of catch-up classes that they mm -hmm. have in, in, in Congo. Um, and all of the girls have now been in school or in a literacy class for uh, about a year and a half. When we look at the Democratic Republic of Congo, they have an estimated 70 armed groups and the majority of those will use child soldiers. Are there any enforceable laws to stop this happening? Is there anything that could be done? There is, yeah. I mean, um, you because there is a war crime, isn't it? It's a war crime to recruit anybody under the age of eighteen, but the majority of them are, are even under fifteen, aren't they? Well, the war crime is if you recruit children under under fifteen. Fifteen. But um, there's an international treaty, um, which is an optional protocol to the Child Rights Convention, that was uh, put in place in two thousand and two, um, which prohibits the use of children under eighteen. And uh, most states or most parties to the UN today have ratified and signed this treaty, including Congo, which means that they are um, responsible to, to stop all use and recruitment of children. And in Congo, you used to have their armed forces that also used and recruited children, and they were um, blacklisted by the UN up until uh, last year when they were taking off that list because they've put measures in place to, um, to prevent children from, from including uh, um, from, from their ranks, from being in their ranks. Uh, but as you say, the armed groups uh, in DRC are still very many, and many of them use children. Under the national 2009 child protection law that you also mentioned previously, it's also uh, illegal to use and recruit any child under 18. Uh, it is criminalised, there's a, a fine, and there's a number of years in prison that you might face. Unfortunately, up until now, um, there's only been one um, case that's actually moved through the court and um, that somebody's actually being um, judged for the recruitment um, and use of children. So there's a lot to do still on the national level of enforcing the laws that they have because they have a good legal framework but needs to be enforced. We read in the newspaper and we hear on the news headlines that some people believe that child soldiers should be prosecuted. What's your take on this? Uh, well, Child Soldiers International believe that um, children in the first place are victims. They are recruited uh, by adults uh, for, for adult purposes for, for to be used in armed conflict. 
and um, it's different. You can talk about um, convictions and you can talk about responsibility. Just because you don't convict a child doesn't mean that you cannot, you're not holding it responsible. In some cases, um, to make sure that a child actually can reintegrate and, and go back to live in, in his or her community, you need to have that. Uh, I mean, in most cases, you need to have that dialogue because mm -hmm. sometimes the child would have committed crimes against uh, his or her own community. So that's what creates the difficulty for a lot of communities to accept these children back. But in many places, we did it in Liberia, you did it in Sierra Leone, did it in Bosnia, um, having these com uh, conversations with communities where children apologize, where the adults in the community apologize for not having been able to protect them from being with the armed group, mm -hmm. that sort of joint uh, reconciliation process um, is very important and it's very efficient. So we know that children can be held accountable but in other ways than, than being criminalised. Uh. Talking about accountability, do you think there's any accountability on behalf of those that are recruiting these child soldiers? Do you think that they'll ever be held to justice? Will anything ever happen? Well, um, we can talk on the international level and there's obviously on the national level and we have some some sort of landmark convictions that has uh, been made the, the last couple of years. Uh, we have the International Criminal Court that works specifically on this in countries where the nations themselves cannot criminalise the, these individuals. But yes, we're talking about a very small number of people who have been held accountable. Um, and we're talking about a lot of uh, individuals who have not been held accountable. But, um, so there's it's heading in the right way, but still a long way to go. Yeah. If people watching this program would like to know more information or perhaps to get involved, where should they go? Uh, well, they could visit our website. Uh, we not only have information about what we do, but we've also just recently um, released a global index which shows information globally on all countries, um, whether or not children are being recruited or used, whether or not they have the legal framework in place, for example. Mm -hmm. So if people want to know a bit more where this is happening, where it's um, where the problem exists, then they can go look that uh, at the website as well. Sandra Olsen, thank you for sharing that with thank us. You. And thank you for joining us on another episode of IOHR Human Rights TV, putting human rights into focus. Don't forget you can keep up to date on our website and on our social media feed. Until next time, goodbye.